Hi, I'm Wade Hudson. I'm Cheryl Willis Hudson. Welcome to Just Us Anne, a series of interviews with book creators and those who get books into the hands of readers. Mirrors, windows, sliding glass doors. If you are a teacher, librarian, book creator, and advocate for diversity in children's literature, you have heard this phrase many times before. You are probably also familiar with Shadow and Substance, Afro-American Experience in Contemporary Fiction, Children's Fiction. This important book established a framework for analyzing literature about Black people. The scholar behind both of these is with us today. Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop is Professor Emerita of Education at Ohio State University, where she has taught courses in children's literature. She is also an author who has written books for adults and children. Welcome, Rudine. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Good to see you guys. Good to see you as well. Good to see you, Rudine. You are a master educator. Uh, did you always want to be an educator? Yeah, I think I could say that fairly. I, I know I was in elementary school when I decided I wanted to be a teacher. Um, I, I enjoyed school and did well uh, and liked my teachers. <laughs> and so that may, may have been what it was, but yeah, since, since I was in elementary school, so are there other teachers in your family? Is there a, a teaching tradition in your family at all? No, um, not at all. <laughs> uh, my uh, parents really had very little opportunity for education. They didn't get beyond elementary school. Uh, and there's nobody else that I know of in my family who is a teacher. Okay. So were you the first uh, in your family to uh, get a college education? I think so. Wow, okay, okay. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about this, uh, the book, uh, Shadow and Substance, and what does mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors mean? Um, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors was a separate article. It was published in 1990. Okay. Uh, Shadow and Substance was was eighty two, mm -hmm. so they they're really they're related, but, right. but one did not come out of the other. Okay. Um, so your question about Shadow and Substance was, well, what what motivated you to to write the book? I, I know it came from your doing research uh, at Wayne State University, I believe. Yeah, I was a I had been a doctoral student at Wayne, um, and. I taught, along with other doctoral students, we taught the children's literature courses to the undergrads. And um, there was a yearly exhibit sponsored by the Detroit Free Press and Wayne of uh, children's books. And one year there, was, there were enough uh, books by and about black people that our um, senior instructor, Don Bizet, pulled uh, together a collection, a sub-collection, which he called the Darker Brother Collection after Langston Hughes' poem. And he uh, wanted to write along with me an article, maybe something longer, uh, looking at those books from our differing perspectives, his you know white male professor and black female graduate student. It didn't happen because it was too close to dissertation time for me to take time away. Um, but uh, the idea stayed with me. So later I decided that uh, it was time to take a look at what books I could find featuring black characters uh, and what was happening in them because it was a time when things were beginning to change. Um, we were in the, in the 70s and we were beginning to get enough of a collection of 
African American books uh, that it was worth taking a look at to see what was going on and how they were different from what had been historically available. So that, that was Shadow and Substance was uh, published in 1982, and you talk about getting the collection together or, or looking at that article in the 1970s. Um, as publishers, we see that there has been some progress since 1970 and 1980. Oh, yeah. um, what have you seen in the industry since that time? Well, I think the most encouraging thing I've seen is the current uh, and recent focus on diversity. I mean, we even have an organization called We Need Diverse Books. Um, but, and, and I've been pleased to see the increase in the numbers of books by and about people of color, uh, as well as the numbers of authors and illustrators who are being published. Uh, authors and illustrators of color who are being published these days. Any suggestions that you have to um, to ensure that this progress continues or even be sped up? Any ideas that you would like to share? Uh, um, <laughs> I wish I had real answers. You know, I could say here, do one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. uh, in my teaching, I encourage teachers to be sure that the books that are in their classrooms uh, are diverse. Um, I think it, when teachers demand diversity, it will happen. You think that has to come from the teachers to de actually demand the diversity in the, in the classroom to bring those books to the library and bring them to the bookstores? I think that is an important step. I'm not sure that's the only thing. I mean, I think librarians also can, can uh, increase the demand, but I think, that's, um, I think that's key, the notion of increasing the demand for diverse books. So I know your area is, is education, but any suggestions for the trade market, you know, getting uh, the books into the marketplace through bookstores and distributors, any, any suggestions there? Because that's, that's usually, uh, getting books in the marketplace sometimes really lags behind getting books into schools and, and even libra libraries. Yeah, uh, when I go to my local big chain bookstore, uh, I have a difficult time finding books with African American characters. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I keep saying I want to go over and volunteer to be a buyer. <laughs> A buyer. Mm -hmm. um, a buyer, you know, help them to know what should be on those shelves mm -hmm. that I can't find when I go to look for it. Um, <laughs> you followed up um, Shadow and uh, Substance with a, another book, Free Within Ourselves. Um, and in, in that book, you talk about the development and history of culturally relevant materials that go back to the 1920s. Um, what inspired you to write that, that book, Free Within Ourselves? Well, I think it was time, I thought it was time to look back and see what had happened since um, Shadow and Substance. Uh, and there was, uh, you know, I had been following African American children's literature as well as I could. And so I thought maybe it was time to pull that together and, and get it get it out there. And you've done academic work, but you've also done uh, biography, Bishop Daniel Payne, who was a great black leader. And many people don't know about his life and his important work. Why was it important for you to write that biography? Well, I kept running across his name when I was looking at the history of African-American children's literature, in part because part of the 19th century history takes you to the, the black church, which is publishing books uh, or material at least aimed at children. Mm -hmm. um, and his name kept coming up because he was an advocate for education. Uh, 
and I started reading about him and I found his life fascinating. I mean, he started teaching, he started a school when he was maybe 19 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he was also an advocate for educated, an educated ministry within the AME church. And partly because I'm an AME, I suspect I took some pride in, uh, in learning about what he had done. So, um, yeah, I, I want to go back because um, we didn't really um, talk about the meaning of uh, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. Can you really talk more about that that concept? Um, I'm not sure how much more I can say about it. It's uh, it, I found it to be a useful metaphor. Uh, this notion of of finding yourself in literature, uh, you know, the mirror notion. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's not just that. I mean, I didn't want to suggest that, that African American children should read only African American uh, literature. Uh, and, and I did want to suggest that people who are not African American do read African American and read a, a wide range of books. Um, because even though we look, we, we maybe read to see ourselves, we also read to, um, to know that we're not alone. And so there's that human connection that I want kids to have. Uh, and so it's, it's that. And, but I realized that, you know, you can, you can, the mirror, you see yourself, the window, you see others. Um, but I don't want people to just stand outside and see and observe other people. I wanted them to be able to get into the experience itself, which, which is the sliding glass door. Um, so that's what that means. Yes, does well, we, that explain? <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, we want to thank you for that because uh, oh, a lot of people okay. uh, use that. And uh, I also want to want to um, talk about your... Uh, your work on uh, selection committees for book awards. Uh, you've mm -hmm. served on a number of them. Uh, I don't think most people know what's involved in that, that, uh, that kind of work. So could you just share what you, what you do when you're on a committee and what's involved uh, in selecting uh, these books that win all these important awards? Well, mostly what it involves is reading a lot. You get I got to be on um, first name basis with the UPS driver <laughs> when I was <laughs> on the Caldecott and the Newberry uh, committees. His books just, just come all the time. Uh, so there's a lot of reading and note taking and some communication with other committee members. Uh, but then ALA has, and, and these are our ALA committees mostly, uh, there are rules about how the selection is made uh, and how the vote is conducted. And so you, you find yourself following those rules. Um, yeah, the, the, um, there have been a number of uh, people of color who've won uh, some of these important awards. Um, and um, I think that the hard work that, that you have done and others like you have really helped to to open the door uh, further. Are you satisfied with the progress uh, in that area of diversity, seeing uh, more people of color being honored in, in such a way? Well, I'm certainly pleased to see more people of color being honored. Um, satisfied maybe a little step beyond where, <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, where I am at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I am pleased to see that, that people are paying attention to uh, authors and artists of color. Well, we've had an opportunity to meet uh, your wonderful husband, Jim, and uh, you know, he's a, a great man. So can you just talk a little bit more, the, a little bit about how you all support each other? I mean, you're very, very close. Uh, and uh, we, can, we can see that when we are around both of you. 
So how do you, you, uh, you all support each other? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think in part it's giving each other room to do what we need to do. He's very involved in um, uh, the affairs of his alma mater, Le Moine Owen College, which is an HBCU in Memphis. Mm -hmm. um, and he's also involved in Americans for Democratic Action, political advocacy group. Uh, so, and all of that takes time. And uh, so part of the support is not pressuring him not to do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and he is there, I mean, he's always sort of asking what he can do to be helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He, uh, he also does the cooking. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> what 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 kind of cuisine? What what is his best dish? Oh, well, I don't know. He loves scallops. He does that well. Um, I don't know. I mean, just there's no particular cuisine that that he goes for. Okay. Your basic stuff: fish, chicken. <laughs> <laughs> but but Rudin, you are, I believe, if I'm not mistaken you were born and raised in Pennsylvania is that that's correct yes can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, growing up and what where you grew up and what that was like for you I know you mentioned earlier that you were the first one in your family to get a college education can you just talk a little bit about your your background and growing up uh, in Pennsylvania well it was um the hard coal regions, anthracite regions, I, the name of the town was Pottsville, P-O-T-T-S-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. mm -hmm. um, and there were not very many African Americans in the town. Um, and so the schools were not segregated. There were not enough of us to segregate us <laughs> and um, we started our first ex uh, formal education experience was at the Lincoln House Nursery School uh, which was run by Mrs. Edith Foster who was sort of one of you know, she was the mother of the church taught Sunday school um, and from there into the Pottsville Public Schools where there were seldom more than two or three African-American kids in a class at, at any one time. Um, I, I enjoyed my school years for the most part. I don't, don't have any, any complaints. Um, the town itself was, uh, I'm trying to find a, a word, there were certainly some uh, understood discrimination going on. Mm -hmm. There were certain jobs that we knew were not going to be available to black people. Um, but for the most part, it, things were pretty good, I thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my neighborhood, although <clears throat> most of the black folks lived within a certain range uh, within the town, um, there, that area was not racially segregated. There were uh, there were white folks who lived in the, in the same in the same areas. Mm -hmm. So I think all in all, it was a good experience growing up in Pottsville. Uh, is Pottsville close to West Virginia? How far is no. no, it's it's hard call West Virginia. I think maybe between this, I don't know, but it's. It's well, Pottsville is eastern Pennsylvania. It's about fifty miles south of Scranton. Right. Okay. 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 Thirty-five miles north of Reading, if that means anything to anybody. Right. Wait, wait. Reading, I'm familiar with. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. I think we're about ready for our lightning round. We talked about the professional stuff and uh, uh, the awards and the committees. So this is 
uh, how the lightning round works. We're just going to ask you a couple of questions and you can just give us the first response uh, to any of those questions. Okay. Okay. So what's your favorite book? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Of all the novels that you've read. <laughs> yeah, the last, the last thing I've read usually. Um, so it will vary, but the last thing was Mildred Taylor's All the Time, All the Days Past and All the Days to Come, which I think is, is wonderful. Great. So the, that's my current favorite. Okay. Here's another toughie. Who is your favorite writer? Ha <laughs> <laughs> uh, You put me on the spot. <laughs> I'm going to give you two, uh, Jacqueline Woodson okay. and, and Jason Reynolds. Okay. okay. Good, good answer. Good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Who then has influenced you the most? Oh, dear. Um, that's an interesting question. It, it could be Charlotte Hawk in terms of children's literature. She was the grand dame of children's literature and education. And when she retired, she was, I think, instrumental in recruiting me for Ohio State. Okay. Uh, so her influence is very strong. Um, probably my uh, dissertation advisor, Ken Goodman, also. Good. So what kind of music do you like to listen to when you <laughs> want to unwind? <laughs> well, um, I, ha I think I have eclectic tastes, you know, some jazz, some uh, R&B, some gospel. Okay. Uh, I tend, I think, to go for performers rather than genres. So, you know, uh, Whitney Houston. Um, okay, all right. <laughs> Pyrus Chestnut. Yeah. Um, on the piano. There was a time when I was a, a big, big fan of uh, Roberta Flack. Mm. Uh, so it varies. Okay. Uh, is there one thing, or what one thing would you like to do that you have not had an opportunity to do? Oh, dear. I think I've been blessed to be able to do most of what I wanted to do. I mean, I've traveled, I've, uh, I've gone to school, <laughs> I've taught, uh, um, I found Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, and then how long have you all been married? 33 years. Okay, That's okay. A good, good, yeah. good, good. good. In yeah. counting. In counting. Great. In yeah. counting. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, Dean, we're about at the end of the uh, interview. This has really been enriching, and uh, we want to thank you for sharing with us. But we also want to just thank you for the enormous contributions that you've made uh, to uh, advance and pr promote diversity in literature. And Cheryl and I just want to say thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. And um, well, I want to say thank you back because you too have made a real difference uh, in, uh, in the availability of books uh, by people of color, black people in particular. Uh, and that's, that's been such an important contribution. Well, thank so you. thank you. Good, thank you, thank you. And we wanna thank our viewers for, uh, for tuning in and that we want to invite them to join us next time uh, for another uh, segment of Just Us and when we will talk with book creators and those who are responsible for getting the books into the hands of readers. And as we like to do, we close out each of our interview sessions with this. Remember, good <laughs> book make a difference. Thank you, Rodine. Thank you.